Well, let me start by asking a question. You know, if you were to set out to establish your family kind of from the beginning, and you say, okay, here's certain principles, certain rules that we want to set out, certain ideas that, that we want to be the foundation of our family, what would they be? You know, if you could make them no more than a, a paragraph. You know, some of us might joke about that we have certain things that we live by, certain rules that, you know, you almost ask your kids, you know, well, what do we always say? You know, we ask our kids, you know, well, life isn't fair, and, and uh, you know, the world doesn't revolve around you, and, and, and some of those things, a common response might be, you know, the golden rule. And, and I remember even as a child, sometimes we'd have a disagreement with my dad. He'd tell us to do something. We didn't want to do it. And, and he'd come back and say, well, you know, our family is, is driven by the golden rule. And do you know what that is? And we're like, well, that's do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. And he'd say, no, it means the man who has the gold makes the rules. Go do what I told you to do. <laughs> and, uh, or we could take a good Mother's Day one, you know, if mom isn't happy, nobody's happy. You know, that's a good Mother's Day rule that we can go by. And, uh, or what if we were to ask not just a question of establishing a family, what about establishing a country? It's interesting as we get into this whole presidential thing, you have all these people that are out there that are, that are kind of giving ideas of this is what I think the, the foundational ideas of the country needs to be. Well, let me ask you this question. If God were to establish a people a family, a, a, even, a, even a nation, what ideas would he give to be the foundation of that family, of that nation? In this case, we don't really have to ask theoretically because God has given us those ideas. You see, the Bible tells us that over 3,000 years ago, God did establish a nation, a people of, of followers of him, and they were going to be established as a, not only as a church in a sense, but even as a nation. And he gave them principles that said, okay, now as you establish this nation, let me give you principles that are going to be at the foundation of everything that I want you to be. And it's the passage that we read this, this morning. It's, it's that, that's the principle, that's the, the passage that, that actually the Jews over the histories, over 3,000 years since that has been given, that they would say, this is the founding passage, this central passage. Let me give you the context. It's the book of Deuteronomy is that the people of Israel have, have left Egypt. They've been in the promise or, or the wilderness for 40 years. They're about now to go into the promised land. And they know that Moses isn't going with them. And so to prepare them for the promised land, to set them off now as this country, this people that God is going to establish, Moses, in a sense, gives these last words, these final words of instruction to his people. In Deuteronomy, much of it is a retelling of the law. It's taking all the things that God had communicated and saying, okay, well, let me tell them again, to repeat them a second time, to make sure you've got them. He's saying, okay, let me make sure that you haven't, don't forget these things. And in chapter five, he gives the, the 10 commandments and he repeats those again. And then he thinks, okay, well, but the problem is that sometimes there may be people that memorize these things, but they really don't understand them. They don't live them. They don't, they don't, make them central to who they are. And so he gives them words that we see here in Deuteronomy 6. I think, again, that's a pretty applicable truth to our time and our culture. And through the centuries, this passage here in Deuteronomy is, is again, probably the most known and most important passage to those of, of the Jewish heritage, the Jewish faith. It's a passage that's known as the Shema. If you just say the Shema, they, everybody knows what that is. It's a word that's taken from the first word of the passage in English, hear, hear, O Israel, that's Shema. And it's seen as the great statement of the principles upon which the people of God, the people of Israel, are to build their families, to build their country. For literally thousands of years, Jews have been reciting this passage pretty much at every synagogue meeting. Every time they come to worship together, they will recite this passage. It's something that if you're an you know, observant Jew, they will recite it in their prayers twice a day. They will re, you know, they memorize this. In fact, it's a passage that if you go through at bar mitzvah when you turn 13 and you become an adult, it's one of the passages that you are required to memorize because it's seen as, again, as foundational and central. And so here when we look at this incredibly important passage, we've got to say, okay, what is it teaching? Why is it something that is so essential that again, that the Jews for 3,000 years have seen it as the most central passage of all of the Old Testament, 
the most central command for establishing families, for establishing a people, a, 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 a community of believers, of even a nation. But let's think about, first of all, the meaning of that command. And first of all, the, real, the, the heart of the command is, is the first word there, the Shema. It's the command, hear. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, our Lord is one. Now we've got to ask, if the command is hear, then what is God calling us to do? What does it mean to hear? The Hebrew word Shema here is a great word that there's, there's no real equivalent in English. And so we can look at it, it's, you know, we translate it as, as hear, but, but that only gets a little bit of it. It means far more than to audibly hear something, to just listen to it. In other places, it's actually translated as not hear, but learn. So it means that we go beyond just hearing something, but also that we understand it. We understand what it means. So this being Mother's Day, let me use an illustration of, of parenting. And so any of us who have had children, we can understand that there are times that you tell your kids something, and, and it seems like it's in one ear, out the other. You know, they, they, you, know you, you tell them, did you hear me? Yes. And you're like, I don't think they heard you. you know, it's, and the thing is, is when you look at it, it's not that they have a hearing problem. It's not that they audibly didn't hear what you said. They have an intellectual hearing problem. Say so they heard it, but they don't get it. They're not paying attention. They, don't, they aren't trying to understand it. They're ignoring it. But actually, the word even goes deeper because it's not only has the idea of hearing and of learning or understanding, but it also is translated obey. And so it has the idea not only that I would hear something and understand it, but that I would then do it, that I would act upon it. And so again, let's go back to that parenting illustration. At times, you know, we've told our kids, I would tell my kids, okay, here's what I want you to do, and I tell them what to do that. And then they go out and they totally ignore me, they disobey me. And what we often say as parents is what? Did you hear what I told you? How many of you have ever said that, right? Didn't you hear what I told you? Now the fact is they could turn to me and respond back, well, yes, I listened to everything that you said, I just chose to disregard you. <laughs> and they could say that. They don't say that because they know that they would probably get them in more trouble, but, but the fact of the matter is that's probably the most honest answer they could give. I know I heard it, but I just chose not to obey it. You see, because hearing, when it talks about hear, it means that I not only hear, not only understand, but that I actually then act upon it. So what God is calling us here to is to say, I want you to not only hear, I want you to not only go to Bible studies and start to understand, those are all good things. But I want you to take this and go beyond that. I want, to, I want you to not only understand the truth of the Bible, but I want to say, are you obeying it? Are you living it out? Is it shaping your thoughts? Is it shaping your behavior? Is it shaping your, your, your attitudes? Is it, is it reshaping who you are? So he wants to make sure that we, we've heard and understood, but what is it that he wants to make sure that we've heard and understood? What is the focus of the command? And so we look again, verse four. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. Now, if you have any question about the importance of this command, and well, maybe that was just even back the Jewish people and they misunderstood. Actually, Jesus himself affirmed that this is the most important passage in the Old Testament. Because Jesus himself was asked, what is the greatest commandment? And look at what he says in Mark chapter 12. He's asked the greatest commandment. Look, this, these are his words. The most important is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And he quotes this whole passage. And so what he's doing here is he's affirming this, but what he's calling us to is not just hear and understand, because it's more than just a theological statement about there only being one God. There's, it's a practical statement that he wants us to understand and to live, to apply. And so what is that truth? First, we need to start with the truth that the Lord is God. He rightly deserves the place of God in our lives. And as such, he has the right to determine what is true. He has the right to determine truth on all issues of morality. And the question is, okay, are we living as if he really is God? That he actually has the final say, that he's the one that defines truth. You see, and we've got to say, okay, you know, this is something that, that is 
not only truth like on spiritual issues, but when you look at it, it actually goes to every area of life. So when it says, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, what he's saying is it's not only that the Lord is God, but when he's one, he's teaching that there is one God who, de- who exercises divine control equally over all areas of life. It's a call to literally recognize and submit to God's, lord- God's lordship over every area of our life. You see, sometimes you know, I'll talk to people and, and we'll, you say, well, I know that God is, I'll go to church and God's here and but then we go out and we go into the workplace or we go into entertainment and we go into relationships and, and we have one set of principles here and then we just really don't, don't really think that God is sovereign over these areas. And so that I'm not distinctively different in, in my workplace, I'm not distinctively different in my entertainment because I'm not saying that there's one God who's sovereign over all things. No, no, it's saying, no, you've got to understand this is the foundational truth. There is a God and he is one. He is sovereign over all things. And, and it's also, sometimes we get it wrong in another way that we look at it and we say, well, there's, well, I believe in God as far as religious truth, but then we divide that out and we say that there's different categories and, well, God is sovereign there, but, but then you have scientific truth. Well, here's what the Bible says. Here's what science teaches. Here's historical truth and, and we divide that out. And we've got to realize that, no, he's saying, no, that God is one. He is God over everything. And that means that his truth is truth that ultimately, when you look at it and say, what the Bible teaches is totally consistent with science. That God is is true in science. He's true in history. He's true in every aspect. That there isn't anything in which God isn't sovereign. that That he isn't the ultimate source of truth. That everything in life ultimately comes under his control, is defined by his character, by who he is. And it means that if we understand that, we will then give him the place of God in every area of our life. It also means that not only is he one in every area of truth, in every area of life, but it says that if he's one, it means that he's one in time. And in fact, he doesn't, meaning he doesn't change. Not only does God doesn't change, but the application of his truth, the meaning of his truth, doesn't change in time as well. See, we live in a culture where we see certain aspects of morality, especially now sexual morality, where people will argue, well, I know I believe in the Bible, but time has changed. Things have progressed. We understand things differently. And and so often people will then look at what the Bible says. Well, that's outdated and things have changed. And what we need to realize is that no, God is one, that he is one in time and things don't change. You see, the question we often ask is this, how does our moral standards match up to the modern beliefs? And and we've got to match these up, and and that's the wrong question. The the fact is, is what we've got to look at is, is not how do what I, and here's modern beliefs, and how do I match up, how do I move to them? No, the question is, how does our morality match up with God's standards? Because he's God, he's one, he's one sovereign over all things, over all time. And for those who you know, miss this, we've got to realize that you know, people argue, well, but you don't understand how things have changed. The, the Bible standards were always out of date. They were always, they never fit the culture. If you go back and if you understand the Roman Empire, when these were written, you would understand that they were just, out, just as offensive, just as out of, out of touch then as they are now. You see, but it was always truth. It's not truth that the world liked. It's not truth that, that agreed with the world system, but it's always truth. And so the question is, to what degree do you agree, you know, to what degree does your life align with what God says? Is he Lord over all areas of your life? Now we we'll continue, it's not only a command that says, okay, is he, is he there, but there's a responsibility to this command that, that's here as well. And this is where you see it foundational, not, not only to our own faith, but you see it as something is foundational to the foundation of our families and our churches and, and literally our countries. Look at what it says. He doesn't just that we need to say that we need to affirm this as faith in our own lives, that we need to love him with all our heart, soul, strength, and might. We need to do that, but we then also need to pass that faith on, that commitment on to our children. It teaches that the key for a healthy family, the key for a healthy culture, the key for a healthy nation is people who not only are followers of Jesus Christ, but that are also then teaching that to the following generations. 
Look at what it says, verse six and seven. And these words that I give you, that I command you today shall be on your hearts. They should be real to you. They should be something that's real. But then don't stop there. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit at your house, when you walk along the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. And there's a responsibility here of, of being intentional in teaching and passing this on. You shall teach them diligently. It's not just something that, you know, that we hope that happens. No, there's an intentionality. We have that responsibility. And look, what does it say? It doesn't just something we do once a week. It, should you bring them to church? Yes. But that's not it. That's, that, this doesn't stop there. Look what it says. You shall teach them when you sit in your home, when you walk on the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. You know, every aspect of life, Everything that happens from the time that you get up to the time that you go to bed, when you're at home or when you're walking along the way, when you're out of home, all of those things, we should constantly be seeking to be able to pass on our faith to the next generation. And, and yes, going to church should be an important priority. Yes, even doing devotion time should be an important priority, but it should be more than that. It should be part of our everyday life that our kids, our grandkids, you know, those that we interact with should see our faith in everyday living that the Lord is one. Now, one word of encouragement, though, I know even as we, as we see some of these testimonies, we realize that we have some of these people that are coming to our, our church that are, that are so young in the faith, and they need people to teach them how to do this. They need people to invest in the lives of their children. At times, one of the struggles that we have is when you have so many people that are coming that are so young in the faith, we're trying to find Sunday school teachers who can teach because the parents don't have the foundation to be able to be teachers. And I hope and pray that there will be some that say, no, I realize that, okay, I've raised my children, but God calls me to continue to be able to do this, to build a healthy community, a healthy church. I, I hope and pray that there will be some people that will kind of come out of retirement and say, no, I'm gonna come back and, and I need to invest in the lives of children, disciple kids, because God's called us to do this. This is the foundational teaching of, of a community. And so we're called to teach intentionally. We're also called to teach through our, our examples. In fact, that's the primary thing we're called to teach by. Look at verse seven again. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk about them when you sit in your home, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. So you can teach that intentionality, but then how do we teach? You shall bind them as a sign on your hand. They shall be as front lengths between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and your gates. Now he's talking here in very figurative language. Unfortunately, there have been uh, some who, especially the Jewish faith, that are strict Orthodox who have taken this and they take it very seriously, but they take it literally. And so, so there have been some that have actually taken these and they take these little boxes and they put these verses in these boxes and then they strap them to their heads and they wrap them around their hands. And so they're saying, well, we're obeying God by literally writing them on our heads and writing them on our hands. In fact, I, I thought it was interesting. I was kind of looking at this and I saw that, you know, you could even buy, find a Barbie that's got one of these things written on her head. You know, it's kind of like, it was, so we teach our kids to, to follow God's word. No, but you've got to realize that there's a much stronger meaning. And the stronger meaning is it's figurative in saying this, here's how we live it out. You live it out as if, if people see it in your hands, in your actions, that it's there, that it's, there's people watch you, they see not only your thoughts and it's written here, but it's literally like, you don't have to tell them you're a follower of Christ because it's right here. It, it's written on your life. That when you walk into your home, it's, yeah, it's a great to have a thing written on our doorpost, yeah, that's wonderful but it's almost saying you won't, don't need to have it written there because it's written by your, by your example, by your life that we live this out in a way that is so real that, that, it's, that it can't be missed. And ultimately, the, most strong, the strongest testimony that we can give to our kids, it isn't necessarily just what we tell them. It's what we show them. It's when we live out these examples and when they see us struggle with these ideas and, and they see us struggle, okay, how do I live out of my faith? How do I forgive? How do I, how do I live this out? And they see, okay, I, I, have parents that, I have grandparents that know how to live these truths. This is what it not only sounds like, this is what it looks like. And when our kids are taught through our examples, they get it. Now the problem is that some of us can have a hard time knowing how to do that. 
And what we've got to realize is that it's not only teaching us that we should teach by example, but that also we learn by example. And to be able to, you know, we have to first learn it to teach it. And so some of us might struggle to say, how do I do this? You know, how do I, I don't know how to deal with my anger. I don't know how to deal with, how do I live out my faith in my workplace? How do I, how do I do this? No one's ever taught me. I didn't have the examples. I didn't grow up in a strong Christian home. I didn't, I didn't have that. And what we have to realize is, you know what this is saying? It's saying this is how we're to learn as a community. And so it's not only that I need to live this out, it means that I need to engage with other believers in such a way that I'm seeing them do it, that I'm hearing them. That, that's why we have APFs and, and Bible studies and, and all these different things, and we strongly encourage you, don't just come to Sunday morning worship. Get involved in some kind of small group community where you're living life with people, where you're talking about living these out, where you're struggling. Build some friendships where you come and you say, Man, I don't know how to do this. And we've got people that can speak truth into your life and where you figure it out together. Because it's not only what we're called to model, it's we're in a sense called to model the process of learning. And there might be times that you say, but I messed up and I, you know, my kids, what do I do then? The most powerful example is our surrender to Christ. When we come up in with our kids or our grandkids and we say, I messed up, and we admit that, and I ask God to forgive me, we're teaching them how to be a follower of Christ. When we're showing them, when we say, I don't know what to do here, and I'm gonna go seek advice, where I'm gonna go God's word, we're teaching them how they are to learn. It's not that you have to know everything, but you're committed to this process. And if you're committed to this process, there's an incredible promise. And, and to look at this promise, I'm going to take you to the very end of Deuteronomy because there's an incredible promise here that I want you to see. Let me go to Deuteronomy at the very end of the book. Moses is, you know, just is, is literally sending the people in the promised land. It's the very last words that he speaks as he's saying goodbye to them. He's, he's you know, kind of summing up everything that he's challenged them to do. Look what he says, De- Deuteronomy chapter 30. See, I have set before you today life and good and death and evil. If you obey the commandments of the Lord, your God, that I command you today by loving the Lord your God, by walking in his ways, by keeping his commandments and his statutes and his rules, then you shall live and multiply and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you're entering to take possession of it. But if your heart turns away and you will not hear, but are drawn away to worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall surely, uh, you shall surely possess, or that you shall surely possess, you shall not live long in the land that you are going to over the Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life that your offspring may live. Loving the Lord your God, obeying his voice and holding fast to him, for he is your life, the length of days that you may dwell in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, to give to them. Now here's what it's saying to each one of us. In these, these words of close, you know, when we look at these, these promises are so different than every other promise that you might hear in the culture. The culture is out there saying, you know, find this, you know, get money, that's life. Get the relationship. If you get the girl, if you get the guy, that's, that's life. If, if you get possessions, that's life. If you get achievement, that's life. And the Bible says, no, that's a lie. Don't buy it. It's not true. What bad God's word is saying is, no, we all have two choices. We're all going to choose. Either you choose life or you choose death. And you could ignore God's word. And you could go by the wisdom of the culture and the wisdom and the promises of the world. And, and you can listen to it but not obey it. But what the God is saying is, if you do that, you're choosing death. That's not my, my words, that's God's word. You will never experience the life that God has designed for you to experience. But that's not a word of condemnation, it's a word of invitation because he turns to us and says, now here's my word, now choose life. Choose, this is in front of you, I'm offering it to you. I wanna, and says, I wanna urge you, when you look at this passage, when you look at all of this, everything else in the world says it's all lies. Don't buy the lies, but choose life. This is where life is found. I want to encourage you to embrace it, to pursue it day by day. If you've never trusted in Christ, if you don't have a relationship with him, he invites you today, choose life. Choose him. Embrace him. 
In him alone will you find that. In, in him will you find forgiveness of sins. In him you'll find relationship with him. And if you've trusted in Christ, I want to challenge you. That don't just say, oh, I prayed the prayer and then go on your own and do it on your own. No, because we can't. The fact is the only way that we will discover the life that he calls us to is to become students of God's word, people who seek to learn and live it out in the context of community. So I appeal to you, choose life. Choose life upon your life. Choose life and, and pass that on to your children and your grandchildren. Give hope. There's a message of hope. And today we stand before God and say, okay, what is your choice? And he says, this is a choice. Choose this as the foundation, not only for your life, but the foundation for your family. And as you live it out, pray that it will become increasingly the foundation even of our culture and of our, of our country. Thanks for joining us. If you have any questions about what we talked about, Jesus Christ, our church, or anything else, connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, or by email. We'd love to hear from you.